So, okay. So, hi everyone. My name is Maya Schoenbach. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist. And today I really wanna to talk to you about support. Um, really how important it is, especially for people uh, struggling with a BFRB. Um, we're in the holidays now. This is often a really time, a time of isolation that people have find extra uh, difficult to cope. Um, so really one of the things that you can do is to seek out community and to, to seek out uh, more support. So um, today we'll talk about that. And I first wanted to talk a little bit, just say a little word about uh, BFRB. You can see here the slide is BFRB. So BFRB or body focused repetitive behavior, it's actually um, an umbrella term that, that encompasses lots of different behaviors. The main types are skin picking and hair pulling, but also includes other things like nail biting, cheek biting, things like that. Um, so I'll refer to mainly skin picking and hair pulling here, but when we talk about BFRBs, um, often people have more than one or, um, yeah, so it's kind of a, a all um, umbrella term. Um, and so just a couple of things, this talk is probably going to be about 30 to 40 minutes. And then at the end, really want to, uh, encourage you to stick around because first of all, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So I wanna encourage you throughout the, the talk today to write in any questions or comments that you have in the chat and then we'll go through them all together at the end. And then also uh, if you stick around at the end of the presentation, I'll have a, a promo code for you. If you wanna subscribe to our uh, programs like Skin Pick or Chick Stop, you'll have $100 off your first month of subscription. So definitely stick around for that. So let's get started. Okay, so let's just go a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, um, we'll go over a quick uh, case example of uh, the story of Lou with a pseudonym. Uh, we'll talk about some of the benefits of support groups. Um, I'll talk about different types, so peer-led, clinician-led, and the benefits of uh, the different types also. I'll give you some practical tips on how to support someone with BFRB, so whether you're supporting somebody else with a BFRB, if you're a parent supporting a child or someone in your family or a friend, um, or for, these are tips that you can give to other people to support you if you're struggling with a BFRB. Um, I'll talk about some specific uh, things uh, for support that we offer, uh, specifically at Skin Pick and Trick Stop. Um, we'll do a quick conclusion, then we'll go into Q&A. Okay, so the story of Lou. So I really want to start with, with a, a story here. So again, like I said, Lou is a pseudonym, so there's no issues with privacy, but I just want to start, I think it kind of um, talks about, it's a good example of, of support. Okay, so Lou um, met a support group leader um, for hair pulling disorder or trichotillomania while she was a client at a specialist uh, hair loss salon in London. So Lou had been wearing a wig for over a year and she had eventually decided to come to her first uh, support group meeting in London and this was back in January 2016. So in the support group, Lou was one of 15 people. And so when it came time for her to share about, about her story, she became extremely upset and broke down. And the group all, <clears throat> all together, they really, they quickly comforted her. They gave her tissues to dry her tears. They were really supportive and there for her. And the following month, um, the following month, Lou returned to the support group. It was a monthly meeting. Um, and the group was amazed to see her without her wig. She came in, her hair was buzzed short. She really looked confident and happy with her new style. So this is something that she wrote to her uh, support group leader after she continued attending the support group. And she wrote, the thing that has helped me the most has been getting to know other people with BFRBs. It's amazing being able to talk about the frustrations and challenges of people who know exactly what you are going through. I can talk freely about my trick now. I never could have imagined being so open when I was younger and overcoming this shame associated with this behavior has been liberating. So really, this is just one example of the incredible change 
um, and resilience and, and strength that can be gained from joining a support group, specifically a BFRB support group. Okay, so now, uh, like we saw from Lou's story, there's a lot of different benefits of support groups. So let's break them all down together now. Okay, so really one of the most challenging um, elements or, or things having to do with BFRBs, um, like, we like Lou talked about, is that the idea of stigma and shame and secrecy that's a that surrounds um, skin picking and hair pulling. So many people feel really a deep sense of isolation because often people hide the behaviors, um, they feel embarrassed or they, they fear uh, being judged by them. And so this really starts a cycle of, of guilt, self-criticism, isolation, and then this really exacerbates kind of the, the emotional burden. So really one thing that a support group can do is provide emotional support. So it really provides a, a space, a safe space that people can open up to share about their experiences, their struggles, their difficulties, but also good things, also their achievements, also milestones in their treatment. Um, and then um, really just connecting with people who have undergone similar things can really, you can offer one another emotional support because you really identify with the, the struggles or also the achievements. Um, so stigma and stigma. We talked about that with um, Lou's story. So really, um, by joining a support group, you're able to see firsthand that other people also share your, your same struggles. They also are going through the same thing that you are. So it really, it, it helps to reduce the feelings of shame and isolation because you're in the company of other people that are going through the same things. Um, and then really other people can acknowledge your struggles and it really fosters a sense of, of understanding. Coping strategies. So sharing coping mechanisms with each other in a support group is really effective. People um, can share one, with one another. If there's a clinician, we'll talk about that later in a bit. Um, but you can gain a lot of um, education about different strategies to try and um, to cope with the urges, to cope with triggers. Um, so that can be really, really helpful. It's practical uh, tools. And then motivation. Struggling with a BFRB and, and, and learning to cope with it, it's a lifelong battle really. So um, dealing with it takes patience, it takes resilience. And so being part of a supportive community, really, you can motivate one another. And then also, in order to, to stay on your treatment plan, you can also offer each other encouragement and then keep each other accountable. Maybe in your support group, you can share this week, I am planning to do X, Y, Z. We'll talk a little bit about some strategies later. But then maybe the next time you are in your support group, you can talk about things that you were able to achieve, things that you weren't able to achieve. So it really can help you stay motivated and keep you on track with what you uh, your goals are. Okay, so oops. <laughs> so another important thing um, is working through trauma. So um, a type of therapy that's used often to also work with um, BFRBs is called psychodynamic therapy. And that really under, involves trying to understand the underlying reason for the specific behavior. And so maybe it can also involve trying to uncover the reason, uh, the reason why, but also like the first memory of, um, of the behavior. I see hands raised. Um, if you could write in a question in the chat, then we'll, uh, we'll address them all at the end. Um, so, uh, often, uh, uh, the first time that somebody picks or pulls has to do with a traumatic uh, experience. And then the behavior can really continue to take place in, in a dissociative state. That means that the person isn't aware that they're actually doing the behavior. And we call this automatic picking or automatic pulling, depending on the behavior. Um, and so that is sometimes can be a trauma response. And so I wanted to talk about this in terms of the benefits of group uh, therapy, of group work, um, by uh, Stacey Nakella, who's a clinical licensed clinical social worker, and she's a specialist uh, in trauma work, but also specifically in group therapy. 
Um, and so she wrote, uh, if one group member discusses traumatic material, I may notice that another client has checked out emotionally with their eyes glazed over, which may be indicative of a dissociative response. So like we said, like this automatic behavior maybe or a dissociation. I then have an opportunity to help that client come back into the room, observing her defenses with compassion. So really it's the idea here, what I'm trying to uh, highlight here is that in a group, it's not just the content of things that are being said, it's also the reactions, the interactions between all the different group members. And those are things that can be really um, harnessed and utilized in terms of therapeutic gain. Um, and so really these are all, the interactions are all really important ways to gain support also. And then another uh, important idea, uh, also from Stacey and Cal, is the idea of an individual therapy versus group therapy and group dynamics. So uh, Stacey and Cal wrote about the idea that if you're in one-on-one -on -one therapy with a therapist and the therapist tries a certain intervention, it may not work one-on-one, -on -one, but in a group setting, it might work. So here she gives the example, also it's another pseudonym of Rose, um, so probably it's okay. Um, and so she wrote, in individual therapy, when I would notice her pulling out a hair, I would ask her to put words to her feelings. Her answer was always some version of, it's just a bad habit. And the two of us went through the same routine several times during group sessions. And then one day she was pulling out a hair and a group member said, Rose, your hair pulling is driving me crazy. I want to know what you are feeling right now. And without a pause, Rose dropped her hand from her hair and answered, I'm irritated. Stacy's annoying me. And from then on, she pulled her, her hairs with much less frequency, both in individual and in group sessions. So really, this is, is to highlight the idea that sometimes an individual person, no matter how good the relationship is, no matter how much time you've been in therapy with your therapist, Sometimes there's something about a group dynamic that really can make a difference and offer a different lens and a different aspect of support and create change. Okay, so we've talked about some of the benefits. So now I wanna talk about different types of support groups and the benefits also of each kind. So let's start with clinician type. So um, these are groups, support groups that are led by a clinician, typically a psychologist or a social worker, it could be a doctor. Um, and typically because they're led by a professional, the conversation is typically gently facilitated or could be structured um, in a specific way. Um, and a benefit of this is that typically you have opportunity to ask the, the professional, to ask the clinician uh, different questions, you can ask them about uh, specific uh, tips or, or uh, different skills that you may, techniques that you want to work on, um, and you can gain education in that way. Um, so some groups are actually uh, skills-based, which means that the therapist teaches the group skills and then the group practices them together. Um, and then through that practice, they offer each other support. So that's a great opportunity to learn new skills. And then also there's a lot of different treatment protocols, first of all for BFRBs, but specifically in terms of group uh, dynamics. Uh, so therapists could follow a specific treatment protocol and typically, um, I'm not quite sure actually about research on this for BFRBs, but typically in terms of group therapy settings, um, like I know for DBT, which I'll talk about a little bit later, there's a lot of research done on treatment protocols and really very highly researched treatment protocols have shown to be effective in bringing about change. So that is helpful. And the other type of uh, support group is called a peer-led support groups. And these are um, typically don't have a professional as a leader. So often they could be led by volunteers but they're a peer, somebody that is also going through the same struggle as you. And so really let's go through some of the benefits. So the first is that there's a shared experience. So participants really understand each other's experiences. They can really be there for one another. And that can be very 
um, beneficial or very attractive to people um, to join. Um, everyone in the group knows the day-to-day -day struggles. So specifically for skin picking or hair pulling, they know the daily struggles that you go through when coping with um, these, these difficulties. And so they can give you tips and tricks on how to manage them daily. Um, and so also, like I said, that it's because it's a, a peer group, uh, it's typically more informal than a clinician-led group. And so maybe it's a little bit more relaxed, which could be um, beneficial to some people and more attractive so that it could also be um, allow for more open and honest communication. And that's really, really important when you're talking about support groups. Um, and then just like in clinician-led, peers can also uh, propose and suggest uh, clinical or, or community resources. So say somebody in the group has uh, just learned something new and just tried something, then they can propose it to the rest of the group. Or if they hear somebody going through a specific struggle, they can mention um, a specific resource. And really in this way, it's, it's great to get um, uh, a recommendation from someone that's actually tried it. So that's um, a, a bonus. And then in terms of ongoing support. So like we said, like I said, that it's, it's typically a more informal uh, environment. So often there's really deep connections that are made between people and, and friendships that are, are made. And so they're often in peer-led support groups, there's uh, people meet even outside the support group. They meet for coffee, they meet on Zoom. And um, so there's opportunities for ongoing support even outside the support group hours. Okay, so here I wanted to talk a little bit about this is nothing to do with skin pick, trick stop. I'm just wanted to share with you some uh, resources that I found. So this is, uh, you can Google the TLC Foundation uh, support group directory. And so um, I found here a bunch of different online, um, mostly peer led. I believe all peer led uh, support groups. And so first of all, they have a bunch of different groups that are uh, area location specific. So they could depend on the state that you're in. Uh, here at the bottom, it got a little bit cut off, but you can see uh, for UK and Ireland. So also they always try to, to maintain for the location for a time zone. Um, but also I guess for just closeness, proximity, a feeling of, of closeness for support. Um, there's so many different groups on this um, directory that I saw. There's, I saw for groups just for moms, just for people aged uh, 50 and over, uh, groups in Spanish, um, tons of different groups. So uh, if you're interested in this, you can check it out and just Google the TLC Foundation support group directory. Okay, so we've talked about a bunch of different types of groups now. Now I wanna talk about, give you some practical tips. We're talking about support. How can I support someone with a BFRB or how can I get someone, a loved one to help to support me? Like how, how can I do this? Um, so I wanna talk about some things that are techniques that are really useful now. Okay, so first in general. So in terms of, um, patterns. Sometimes it's easier to, uh, to identify patterns in that someone's behavior if you're on the outside looking in, as opposed to being the person that's actually doing uh, the behavior. So really becoming aware of all the factors that lead up to the picking or pulling and also the, the factors that happen after, also during, like, but that's typically internal. Um, those patterns are very critical to um, to understanding and treating your BFRB because it's, we see it as a, as a cycle, right? Before the, you see the trigger, you uh, will have thoughts and emotions, you'll do the behavior, then you'll have thoughts and emotions after, and it's a, a, a vicious cycle. And so uh, in terms of support, having someone to help you identify the patterns with the BFRB can be very helpful. Um, and, and then they can also help, if they can identify certain triggers, um, then they can help you find different strategies to cope more effectively, which is my second point. 
is that they can help you brainstorm certain different things. So for example, um, a big thing that we use uh, at Skin Pick and Trick Stop, it's the gold standard of, uh, of therapy for treating uh, BFRBs, hair pulling and, and skin picking is called HRT or habit replacement therapy. And one of the key elements in that is called competing responses. So that is where you find an alternative behavior to do instead of the picking or the pulling. And um, so one of the things that somebody could do is help you brainstorm different things to do instead of the behavior. So for example, they could say, hey, here, I, I went out, I went to the dollar store and I bought you a, a fidget toy, or here's a stress ball. Um, so those are all different types of competing responses that typically have a, some sort of a, a tactile element also, but don't have a harmful behavior. And so they could help you brainstorm different ways to do it. And then the other idea of changing the environmental factors, that's another part also of HRT, of habit replacement therapy, um, which we call stimulus control. And in that, it's where you want to change uh, elements of your external surroundings so that you can minimize tr uh, the triggers that you have. So for example, if somebody, if uh, someone in your family notices that you're, t you're um, picking or pulling more frequently in a certain area of your house. So for example, while you're watching TV, you can put, you can help them, for example, write post-it notes all over and put them all over the room to remind not to not to pick or pull. Um, so in terms of healthier means to express and cope with difficult emotions. So often we find um, that picking or pulling is an outlet for a way to cope with an, an uncomfortable or difficult emotion. And um, typically, so we use different ways in therapy to work through that. But a way that you can support someone is to help try give them other ways. So often people really uh, enjoy uh, journaling. That's something that is really good at helping cope and deal, work through emotions. Um, exercise, that's something that's very healthy, very good for uh, emotion regulation. So supporting somebody by working out with them, scheduling walks, scheduling a run together, um, things like that can really help someone cope with difficult emotions in a, in a healthier way. Okay, and then finally, in terms of general tip, um, this might sound very basic or obvious, but it's very important because not everybody's idea of support is the same. So asking someone how you can be supportive for them is very crucial. So for example, sometimes people think that if I, if I just... Um, if I just say every time, every time that the person's picking or pulling, if I just tell them, hey, you're picking, hey, you're picking, then that'll be helpful. That'll be supportive. But then, like we talked about earlier about the idea of stigma and shame, it might make the person feel more embarrassed and then maybe hide it more and then vicious cycle. So it's really important to ask the person, how can I best support you? Where can I best support you? Maybe they want to be uh, like notify that they're picking or pulling, but maybe only at home. So this is um, something that's really important. Okay, so now I want to talk about validation. So validation is a crucial component in building interpersonal relationships in general, um, but especially for providing support. So validation involves acknowledging other and accepting other people's thoughts and feelings um, without judgment. So I should put in the background some different um, statements that you can see that are validating statements. So uh, they are known to like foster empathy. And um, so for example, what I'm learning about you is the question, how can I best support you? What I hear you saying is, so now I wanna talk about some specific techniques about validation. So these are these techniques, these validation techniques here, they're based off of DBT. I mentioned that earlier, or DBT is dialectical behavioral therapy, um, which is known for group work um, also, aside. <laughs> and so these are being uh, deeply researched. So, okay, so active and mindful listening. So an important thing in, in active listening is first of all, maintaining eye contact. 
really being present, being with the person, um, not uh, being distracted on your phone, watching the TV, really giving the person your full attention. You want to also avoid interrupting the person while they're speaking um, and really want to be fully present while they're speaking and then also try to avoid fixing the other person's problem. So avoid jumping straight to, uh, oh, you should do that. Being present, being with them while they're listening, um, trying not to, to plan your response in your head while you're listening. Listen. So it sounds simple, but it's hard. <laughs> um, reflective validation. So this is often done as repeating back or paraphrasing what the person said. And this is really important to make sure that you understand what they are saying to you. So, um, and to make sure you, you've understood their message. So it could be something like, it sounds like you're frustrated because da, 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 da. Um, and really this um, reinforces that you're actively processing um, what they're saying and acknowledging their, their feelings, acknowledging their message. Um, okay, so then validating emotions without judgment. This is very important because you don't want the other people to feel judged or criticized. So you really want to express that it's okay to feel the way that they do. Um, and, and that it's, it's important to accept that they're, accept how they're feeling, accept their feelings. So um, this is an important technique. And then nonverbal validation. So a big one is body language, right? So you don't want to be sitting crossed with your body closed off. You want to be sitting open um, so that you can listen to them. Uh, sometimes nodding while people are talking is helpful really to make them feel um, that, that you feel that you're with them to convey that you're, you're empathizing, you're understanding them. Um, so these are uh, ways to help them feel supported. And then finally, um, to encourage and acknowledge their efforts. This is really important. So to, to notice and to, to say, wow, I, so proud of you or that was such a big step that you did if it was writing the sticky notes and putting it around or signing up for therapy um these are really um important things to to recognize someone's progress really no matter how small it is so this is a important technique also to make someone feel supported okay so normalization now let's talk a little bit about that normalization is really another key component of uh, um, supportive communication, and it kind of builds on validation. So it involves conveying to others that their experiences uh, are not only valid, but also shared by many people. So that's the building on. So now let's talk about some te normalization techniques also through um, DBT, and these are really all ways to make someone feel supported. Okay, so to universalize, universalize their experiences. So you really want to highlight the commonality of different pe of people's experiences. So really to express that people facing a similar challenge would feel similar things. So you could say something like, it's really, it's not uncommon for people to feel like that when they're in that situation. So that's something to universalize it. Um, sharing personal examples. That's a very good technique if it's appropriate. Um, so if you feel comfortable, if you feel that it's appropriate for the other person in the setting, um, so to share personal examples. So that really makes the other person know that there are other people out there also going through it um, and feeling different, feeling similar uh, emotions and going through the similar challenges. Um, but again, I want to emphasize, make sure that it's for the other person to support them, as opposed to, I want to share my own problems now. <laughs> um, so that is, uh, but that is a really good technique. Um, so to affirming the diversity of coping styles. So it sounds complicated, but really what I mean here is to say that everybody copes with challenges in different ways. 
there really is no one size fits all approach to dealing with um, things, to dealing with skin picking, to dealing with hair pulling, to dealing with anxiety, fear. There's no way, one way for every single person. So you really want to validate the other, the their, their way of coping with things and reinforce the idea that everybody has their own unique way of coping with things. And then finally, we really always want to promote self-compassion. So you want to uh, emphasize the fact that everybody has struggles, but everybody and everybody also has opportunities and areas for growth. Um, while uh, next to the idea that everybody also has strengths. So really to reinforce the idea that the self-improvement, it's a journey, it takes time, um, and it's okay to have both progress and also to have setbacks. And this is normal and it happens, normal being the key term in normalization. Um, so for example, here you could say, um, it's really common to have a relapse of, of picking or pulling um, let's think together what maybe you can do the next time that you have an urge to do that. So that's something that you can do together to, to really normalize and promote the self-compassion um, if someone has a relapse. Okay, so now we talked about different um, practical techniques. Now let's talk about the specific support that we offer here at Skin Pick and Trick Stop. We offer a range of different things, so let's go into them together. Okay, so first we have um, on social media, we have Facebook group pages. So we have one for Trick Stop and we have one for Skin Pick. Um, and we have um, basically online community groups that are safe spaces for you to post, to uh, comment, to read, just read if you want, um, different topics uh, with different people that are facing similar challenges. Um, and so really it's a supportive community that you can gain from each other's experiences, you can get advice, feel understood. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, good free resources that are uh, you can find on our uh, Facebook groups. So, uh, you can look those up and join those for free. Those are great resources for uh, support. Next, I want to talk about our online forums, which are uh, kind of a similar idea of a safe space online. Um, but these are very specific um, to skin picking, uh, hair pulling, as are the Facebook groups. Um, but these are their own forum, their own isolated um, plays that are on our website. You can Google a skin pick for online forum or trick stop online forum, um, or you can get to them actually directly through our website. And here you can see I post, I literally took a screenshot of um, the online forums. Uh, and so there are um, different topics that people post. You can post uh, if you want yourself and then see what people respond to you. You can respond to other people. A nice way to engage and, and to uh, foster community. Okay, so therapist support. So we know, we at Skin Pick and Trick Stop, we know that it's really hard to find therapists that have expertise specifically in treating and supporting uh, skin picking and hair pulling. So we have expert therapists with hands on experience uh, dealing specifically with. BFRBs with hair pulling and with skin picking. And so uh, what they do is they build for you an online program that's individualized, tailor-made for you. And then with that online program, you go through it and your therapist is by your side every step of the way. And they're with you um, through written communication. So you write to them and you can do this even daily. Um, and so what your therapist does is they review your progress, they, they review your sessions uh, and your progress in the sessions and your exercises and your assignments, they respond to you, they can tweak things in terms of your practice of the certain techniques. Um, and then they'll engage you in specific discussions about your BFRB, about your hair pulling or skin picking, um, that are specific discussions that are specifically relevant to you, that are specifically 
about what your struggles are. Um, and they're really there to answer any of your questions, even on a daily basis, which is um, very rare. <laughs> okay, and so finally we talked, we started this all off by talking about support groups. So I'm talking back about, so back to talking about support groups. So we at Skin Pick and Hair, Skin Pick and Trick Stop, we have um, therapist led support groups. So here again, I just took a screenshot. You can see we take place multiple times throughout the month um, to accommodate for uh, different time zones. And so these are for uh, our subscribers. Sorry, I didn't mention this. Also, the therapist support is also for subscribers. You need to subscribe in order to um, gain access. However, the online forums, Facebook groups, those are free for anyone. Um, so the therapist-led support groups, um, they really are if you go back and we talk about the clinician um, led group, support group benefits, you get here an expert opinion, someone that is an expert in skin picking, someone that's an expert in hair pulling. They will be there listening to you, helping you, providing you suggestions, support. You can ask them questions. Um, and it's really just an extra resource that we provide for all of our subscribers. So we really, really recommend our uh, subscribers to join them. Um, and so some of the topics that have been discussed in our support groups have been, they've been highly debated also, um, the meaning of hair and skin and the meaning of picking and pulling, um, ideas about perfection, about imperfection. Um, there've been discussions surrounding coexisting conditions like anxiety, depression, uh, or trauma related conditions. Um, there's been discussions about family and social support systems and then also community, big, big topic of, of support. And so I spoke with um, Diana, who's one of our expert psychologists um, from SkinPick, and she works also at uh, TrickStop, and she leads uh, these support groups. And so she's really seen the benefit of the transformation that people go through that when they join these uh, groups. And so she, she wrote to me specifically about this, and she said, many times when people join for the first time, support groups, they join feeling misunderstood and alone, often reluctant to share their personal stories. In time, as they see others who go through similar experiences sharing their stories, they let their guard down and allow themselves to put words to their internal experiences, speak up and share stories that might otherwise never see the light of day. And other participants accept, validate and normalize like we talked about, their emotions. Instead of hearing, why don't you just stop, which has never helped any of them. So I wonder how many of you identify with, with the idea here that some people just say, just stop. But really this, this need and then the, the shame of hiding things and really never talking about your personal experience. And the, this, this desire maybe not even knowing that you have this desire for support and for identification and to connect with people that are going through very similar things. So this is really something that is so special about support groups. So I just wanted to do a short conclusion before we um, go into Q&A. Um, so first we started off with the story of Lou, which is really just a great example of, of the change and the strength um, that you can see from joining a BFRB support group. We talked about the benefits of support groups. So uh, emotional support, reducing stigma, coping strategies, um, that support groups can be motivating and you can hold each other accountable. We talked about clinician and peer-led support groups that, as being the different types. Um, and then we talked about how, uh, we talked about practical techniques on how to support someone with a VFRB. So we talked about the general tips. Um, we talked about validation techniques, normalization techniques, and those are all based in sound re research. Um, and then I talked about some of the support that we offer here at Skin Pick and Trick Stop. So Facebook groups, online forums, these are for everyone. And then there's also therapist support um, and support groups, and these are uh, specifically for our subscribers. So I really wanna thank you all for your attention. Um, and uh, if you want to email me, here is um, here is my email address. 
And uh, if you have any questions about our uh, program, you can uh, email su customer support. There's one specifically for skin, pick one for trick stop, depending who you're struggling with picking or pulling. Um, and as I promised, there's a hundred dollar discount for the first month. Um, if you subscribe, you can use the promo code webinar 100 and you'll get a hundred dollar discount. So thanks for listening. And now let's start Q and A. Okay, so somebody started off by saying my voice cut out. I'm really sorry, I hope it worked better. Okay. Um, and also if anyone has any, uh, had any technical issues, if I had technical issues, um, the recording will be sent around to everyone who signed up. It will also be posted on our YouTube page. Um, okay, so somebody asked, what's the ideal number of people in a group and do the people need to be at the same level of skin picking severity? That's a really good question. Um, I believe that groups are typically can be, they completely vary. Um, I think if they're in person, you would ideally want to limit them um, to around 15 people. That's a frequent number that I've seen in terms of um, support groups. Um, and if you want, you can have them all at the same level of, of severity. But there also is something nice about having people that have worked on uh, their skin picking and they've been able to reduce the severity. And then the people that have more experience that they can share their, uh, their coping techniques with people that are a little earlier on in their journey. So I don't, I think it's very dependent on the people that are there. Um, but those are really good questions. And if you're thinking about starting a group, I was also thinking about talking about this, but we didn't have enough time. But really the idea of like peer-led support groups, everyone can start one. You can start one online and post about it. So, but yeah, I would talk about, talk to the people that are interested in joining and um, and ask them these questions. Really, really insightful. Um, so to avoid pathologizing language. Okay, sorry, you're right. I didn't, uh, maybe didn't talk about this enough. So um, really important to not make someone feel stigmatized about their behavior. So you could say, instead of saying skin picking disorder or trichotillomania, which sounds scary, you could say that your struggle with skin picking or struggles with uh, hair pulling. It's, it's a little bit of a softer language. It's a little bit, um, it, it removes a little bit of the, the stigma around it. So I think that's the big, the big takeaway there. Um, if that doesn't answer your question, write in again. <laughs> Okay, so somebody wrote, can you please discuss how to open a conversation with a person to offer support and assistance? I've tried to discuss with my daughter, funny, but any effort to open a conversation is so hurtful to her, she cannot do it. So first of all, I really want to commend you on being there for her. It sounds like you're really, you want to be there. I'm sure she knows that you're, you want to be there for her. Something that I would suggest is really that that final tip that I gave in terms of the general tips, really to ask her how she wants to best be supported. Because it sounds like maybe she's still in the deep inside the shame and the embarrassment and the stigma that all is very, very, very common uh, with um, common having to do with skin picking and hair pulling. Um, if she's open to it, you could offer to send her resources. You could offer to show her this webinar. We have lots of other webinars on our um, on our YouTube channel. So you can look up Skin Picker Trick Stop. And um, if you want to show her one, if you want to ask her if she'd be willing to look at, look at them together, um, that could be something. Because I think something really is the idea of being there with her and, and trying to to not increase the vicious cycle of the, the shame and the, the embarrassment. Um, I hope that helps. Another question, good question. Um, so another question is, how much time do I need to be in the skin pick program for it to work? 
So this is tough to answer because it's very different for every person. Um, but we do have, we do see uh, from past clients symptom reduction within three weeks. And we do see um, it, it very, it, it varies between people though. In the, the degree of the, of the symptoms from when you start, um, how, how frequently you're, you're working on the program, how much work you're putting into it. There's so many factors that go into it. Um, but like I'm saying, you have this hundred dollar discount for the first month. You could try it for a month, talk to your therapist daily, and then express if you get to the end of the month and you don't feel like you've made any, any significant progress, or you don't feel like you're connected, you can always cancel your subscription. Um, so that's also something. So yeah, if you want to further email me or email customer support to find out more details about um, the program, just send an email. Another question is, uh, can I heal from skin picking? Can I heal without therapy? That's a big question. Um, I think it depends, right? I think Skin picking, it's often a symptom that comes up because of a lot of difficult emotions that you're dealing with. It's a, it's a behavior that you do either automatically, like we talked about, without you being aware of it, or you could be conscious while you're doing it, but you really, you're not able to stop it no matter how much you try. Um, yeah, maybe you could heal spontaneously without therapy. Um, from our experience, People often need um, some evidence-based therapy, which is what we provide that are, are based on techniques that are ground in sound research um, and show to, to make drastic improvements. So that's from our experience, <laughs> what works the best. Um, okay, so somebody, another question was, no computer at their home. I tried fidget toys blanket hats, cap, et cetera, to no avail, suggestions for hair pulling. Um, there's lots of, um, so you're talking about uh, both competing responses and um, stimulus control, which are the key elements of HRT. So really not doing a replacement behavior or modifying your environment. Um, you can check out, we have webinars specifically on these topics and you can check out any different suggestions for that, but it really can be a wide, wide range of things. You need to find the one that works specifically for you. Um, and like I've said, if you want one-on-one -on -one therapy with an expert therapist, uh, TrickStop could be a really, really good resource for you. Another question is, did you say the original episode of picking is associated with an experience of trauma? My daughter's now nine, but has skin picked since age two. It's beyond frustrating, but we finally found a therapist who seems to be helping. I'm now dealing with my shame. Um, so, okay, the original episode of picking is not necessarily associated with an experience of trauma. Not necessarily. It could be. That's what I put it as one of the benefits. Definitely not always. Um, but that is something, it's a possibility. So um, it's really great that you're dealing with your difficult emotions surrounding it as well. Um, and I wanted to let you know also that we have a parent program that we offer for parents of children that are struggling with skin picking and hair pulling. And since your daughter's nine, I wouldn't suggest her to go through our program. It sounds like you have a therapist who seems to be helping, that's great. But for you, if you want to <clears throat> work through your own difficult emotions with the with dealing with your child's your child's uh, difficulties, your child's struggles, then maybe this is a good thing for you. You'll learn, um, you'll gain your own psychoeducation all about the disorder. You'll gain your own techniques on how to work with uh, with your daughter and how to deal with your own per personal emotions as a parent, which is really important. Another question, also the person is older and has dementia, how to say don't pull or stop, need some suggestions. Um, I don't know which question you were adding on to. Um, 
I think you're talking about something very, very specific situation in terms of dementia. I think it depends how severe the dementia is. Um, but you mentioned the knit caps, you said they weren't working. Sometimes putting gloves could help depending on how hot the climate is. Um, but yeah, I, again, I would look up uh, different competing response techniques. Um, we have them on our, our um, website. We also have a blog about them. Um, so really, I would look up their uh, specific techniques and then try out ones. It's a lot of trial and error. Okay, and somebody asked, have you heard any success with the use of NAC supplement? I have heard about NAC in terms of success. Let's see, I have a whole um, thing about NAC. Um, so some of our clients, I'm reading from here just now. So some of our clients have tried NAC while using our program and they have found it useful. I do need to say that there is little research on it. Um, and we also don't know about, um, about side effects. So there's not enough research on it. That's what I would say. Um, but there are some clients that have found some success. Um, the question is, will I have to pay three months, years? I want to know what I'm going into. Typically, clients <clears throat> are in it for months. There are people that have been in longer than a year, um, but it is typically shorter than a year. Um, if you want, you can send me an email and we can talk about it a little bit more um, in depth if it's a personal um, question or to contact support, um, maybe with your hesitancy. Um, but also, like I said, you have a $100 discount, so you can join the first month and see how it goes, see if you connect with it. It's online, it's via chat, via texting, communication. So you also need to see if you connect with that form of communication. I suggest try it and see how it goes. Another question is, um, how long does it take for my hair to regrow? That's a good question. It's, I think it depends um, where, uh, what, what hair is, how, Every person's different. Every person's hair grows, uh, regrows at a different pace. Um, if you've pulled for a long time, sometimes hair doesn't regrow in certain areas. Um, I think that's a, it's a very, very particular specific question. Another question is, I-20 have recently been medicated for TRIC and I've seen no improvements. Notice when I do pull, it seems like it feels good and therefore do it more. Do you have any alternatives for this rewarding sensation? Yes, definitely look through um, competing responses. Um, and also the things that we talked about in terms of um, for, um, coping with difficult emotions. So things that, are, that also give a rewarding sensation. Exercise, perfect one. Gives you endorphins after for a run, for example. Maybe not everyone likes running. But if you go running, it often makes you have a rewarding sensation right after. Um, lots of different things like that. Um, competing responses, snapping a rubber band, using a fidget toy. There's lots of things that also have tactile stimulation. If you look them up on our on our um, YouTube channel, you'll see about competing responses or on our blog also. Okay, so the um person has dementia they didn't don't realize they're doing it and when you say what are you doing this kind of question they reply is i don't know they may not be able to communicate this to you and the gloves didn't work either so it sounds like maybe there is also maybe more advanced dementia it sounds like it's a more specific issue because it's it's with the comorbid of the dementia and the and the picking um or the pulling sorry maybe i would look through again look through the different competing responses that's what it's called the competing responses techniques and see if you think there's something there to try i would try do trial and error with different types of techniques um and also stimulus control so to, like you already tried with the knit cap it's a great one um 
gloves, you already tried that. That's another great one, but ways to also reduce the triggers for the gear pulling. But it also sounds like maybe there's an idea of the element of awareness, which is maybe um, making it more difficult. Uh, can you please repeat the answer about NAC? So yes, so some of our clients have tried NAC while using our program and have found it useful. Um, I did do need to emphasize that there is little research on it and we don't know enough about side effects also. So a comment was, I use NAC regularly for bronchitis and I don't think it helps with my skin picking. Okay, so again, different people have different experiences. So again, like I said, NAC isn't, um, doesn't have a lot of research for picking or pulling. Another question about my nine-year-old or picking seems to be moving from face to arms to legs and now hands. Would you say the underlying problem is not being addressed? It, it could be. Um, you said that this is your daughter that's in therapy right now. It takes time. It really is a long-term journey that takes time to, to work through and understand the emotions, especially if she, you said she was picking since she, or since she was two years old. So because we have so long working through practicing different behaviors of picking, it takes a long time to rewire those pathways in our brain and to find something alternate. So I think it's important to be patient, especially if you think that the therapy is helping. Again, I suggest look, trying out our, the $100 discount works also for our parent program. So that might be helpful for you as well. The other question is, what's your take on using hair color spray on bald areas? Um, I think it depends. It depends on the type of spray. You need to make sure that it's, um, not damaging to your skin. Um, I think it's very dependent if you think that it makes you feel more confident. I think that's a big thing. Um, but again, like working on the underlying issues is very important. Last question is, have you heard about the medication memantine having a side effect of significantly reducing hair people in people who were put on it for something else? I haven't actually. Um, if you want to, I can look it up, send me an email if you want me to look into this a little bit more, my at helpingminds.com, and I can look into this, um, look into some research about that, um, send me a link, uh, send me an email. Another question is where to look for the stimulus control and competing responses. So on our YouTube channel, we have, a, if you look up skin pick or trick stop YouTube channel, um, on YouTube, we have um, different videos all about this, like this webinar about those specific um, techniques. Um, is it a location that's a trigger? Anything can be a trigger. That's the difficulty. It could be a situation, a location, an emotion, a thought. It's very person dependent. Um, and dementia person, person who's in a rehab center at home cannot stress her for months still. So. I'm really sorry to hear about that. It does sound very stressful. It, things could be triggers there. It is very difficult. And it sounds like it's a secondary issue, this um, idea of the, the pulling there. So I think being patient, trying different techniques, um, maybe using the validating and the normalizing techniques that we talked about today, that could maybe help with the underlying emotions there. Okay, so there's no more questions. Um, oh, two more questions. I'm looking now how to find your YouTube channels. Look up on YouTube Skin Pick. Here you can see it here, Skin Pick and Trick Stock on YouTube. And you'll find them there. Oops, okay. Um, may I get the answer again about where to take my children if they have skin picking or nail biting issues? Is there a group for kids? Sorry if I missed the answer before. Um, so we have, so depending on the age of your children, if your kids are uh, 14, 15, depending on the age, depending on their literacy level, they can specifically join our program. But we have a program specifically for parents. Typically we recommend if the kids are younger than 14. 
um, then they join our parent program. So if this is for you, um, definitely look up our parent program and you can use our discount also. I hope that you can find other suggestions. Um, I suspect I have depression. What do you recommend treating first, dermatillomania or depression? Wow, I think it's, uh, they could be intertwined, right? So it's the idea of like working through first, it seems like they're probably intertwined in terms of the difficult emotions. So I would recommend joining therapy, be it our program being one-on-one -on -one therapy, um, but therapy definitely is important, just especially um, to treat both dermatillomania, but also depression. <clears throat> it's very important um, to work through those difficult emotions um, and to get support, which is really what this is all about. Another question is, is there a safe supplement for trichotillomania with de dementia? That's also a very good question and a very specific situation that I'm really unaware of. Again, if you want um, me to look into some research about that, send me an email at my at helpingminds.com with your question and I can uh, look into that for you. Okay, there's no more questions and we have run out of time. So if you have any more questions, please, please email me maya at helpingminds.com and I'd be happy to answer them. Um, thank you for joining and I hope you guys have a nice day.